Hello, this is Kevin Gator with another tutorial for PremiumBeat.com. In this tutorial, I'm going to take a look at a snow particle system technique I developed for this recent film, Champion by Mons Bertus and Daniel Berman. It's a Swedish Western set at winter time, but unfortunately it didn't always snow on cue. So my job was to add snow to key scenes where it could be snowing to add more drama and uh, to introduce this main character. So uh, my work was really cut out for me for two reasons. First off, it was shot in 5K resolution on a red camera. The other problem is Swedish people are probably the most critical people I know when it comes to spotting fake snow in movies. So I also had to develop not only an effective workflow, but a particle system that would fool a keen Swedish eye. So I'm going to share with you the techniques I developed for this film using Red Giant's Particular and After Effects. Let's jump in and see how it's done. Okay, so here we are inside of After Effects and let's take a quick look at what we're going to try to create. So a quick preview and this is the scene from the beginning of the film and it's this particle system that we're going to explore how to develop for ourselves. So if we take a quick look around we'll see there's three different layers so it's uh, a pretty straightforward scene and I have a low res proxy version of the original 5k footage so this is dramatically reduced to more of a, a 720 uh, letterbox to make it more easy for us to use and less processor intensive. I've also got here a black solid that contains my particle effect layer and a 3D camera for rearranging and moving my particles around to composite a little more nicely. So let's just jump in and try to replicate the effect from this. So I'm going to begin by dragging my movie clip to the new comp area and there it is. Now sometimes when you get this type of work the footage will come with a frame at the beginning of the video and at the end of the video just so they can mark in on the edit where this occurs. So I'm just going to trim those off. If I hold down the control key and the arrow key and go forwards once, I can see where the um, frame begins. So I'm just going to pull the work area over one. I'm just going to go to the end and I'm going to hold down the control key again. It's command of you're on the Mac and just going to hit the arrow key back one and I'm just going to pull that over to reach where the playhead is and I'm just going to right click and choose trim comp to work area. So now when I go back to the beginning, we don't see this frame from the other scene. We just see the clip in its entirety. So let's have a little playthrough and take a look at what we have. So it's just a guy walking towards us in the snow and um, now it's an interesting shot, but it will be greatly improved by a snowstorm. So what I need to do first is add a layer and new and solid. Uh, I'm going to make sure that it's the comp size and I'm going to name it snow and click on OK. Next up, I need to find particular and this is a third party plugin. So if you don't already have it installed, you can head over to the Red Giant website and download a trial version of the plugin for yourselves. Otherwise, you'll be able to just type in here particular and it should appear somewhere near the bottom trap code particular and just double click that. Now straight out of the box it doesn't really look too sexy so we'll just see what it's doing right now. And it's just emitting from the center and this is the default setup. So we need to go into the settings and we need to start arranging the uh, configuration for our emitter. Okay, I'm going to put it round about the halfway mark so we can see the changes as we make them. Most of the work is going to begin right here underneath the tab that says emitter. So if we look at the settings for that, we can begin by increasing the number of particles. So I'm going to crank that up to around about 300 just so we've got a little bit more happening on the screen. We're going to keep coming back and changing this value as time goes on. And it's always a good idea to start with a lower value when you begin and then just crank it up before you uh, render out your footage. Uh, the emitter type currently is selected to point, so it's all emitting from one point on the screen. And instead of that, we want to choose box. 
So what a box would do is have um, different settings for the X, Y, and Z. And what I want to do is affect the width. So I'm gonna stretch out the X until it fills the screen. And then I'm going to increase the Z so it spreads backwards and forwards. What we want to have are some particles that fall past the camera, as well as some that appear to be coming from way back in our scene. I'm just gonna zero out the Y position because we only want it to be coming from the top and we're not really wanting it to emit randomly within the height. We just want it to be spread over the X and Z axis. And if we preview it now, you'll notice that the particles are emitting from the center of the screen. So the next thing we want to do is affect the X, Y position. So if I click on that, I can just mark above the screen there. And now the particles are gonna be emitting from the top. So that's all fair and well. We're starting to uh, get somewhere, but it's nothing like snow at the moment. There's a few other settings for us to change before we go too far. Uh, one of which is here, we need to change from linear to smooth. And we'll also change the direction from uniform to bi-directional. And let's preview again, see what's happened. So now they're kind of gathering and populating in a similar area. We can ignore the direction spread, but we need to move down to where it says velocity. If we crank that right up, they're gonna go flying like crazy all over the place. But the uh, default velocity is pretty okay for our needs. But we do want to disable the random and also the distribution. But we can keep the velocity from motion at 20. Let's take another look at what we have so far. So no big differences just yet, but we're starting to get somewhere. Let's move on to the actual particles themselves. So if I reveal this area here, and the first thing we want to consider is the life that they are on screen for. You'll notice that they kind of appear and then after a few seconds, they start vanishing and disappearing. And we want to make sure that they live a little bit longer, long enough for our scene to play out. So I'm just gonna go in here and change the life setting to something like 100, and we might need to adjust that later. And at least now they should stay on the screen for the same length as the footage. So if we watch these particles here, they should stay on the screen and not just disappear at random. The next thing we need to do is change from sphere. Let's just bring them down so we can see them here. We want to change from sphere to something a little less that looks like just a ton of fuzzy balls and choose instead cloudlet. So this is going to have a more snowflakey kind of look. It doesn't look like it at the moment, but with a few other settings changed, it will start to feel a little bit more like a snowflake. So I'm going to change the scale from five to something like three should be enough. And also the opacity, I'm going to knock that right down to about 15. Now it's starting to look a little bit more believable. Let's just preview that. So okay, it's starting to look a little bit more like snowflakes. The color though is pure white. So uh, if we click on the eyedrop tool and look for some snow reference in the image, we can just eyedrop pretty much anywhere where it's light. And it's gonna give it the same color value as the snow that's already in the scene. So that's an added bonus. If we preview now, you see it's starting to look a little bit more like snow but we need to mess around with the physics settings before it really starts to take hold. While I'm still in this neighborhood, we should probably fix the emission extras because what we see is on the first frame, the snow's not there and it would already be snowing when the scene has started. So we can go in here and change the pre-run to something like 10. And that's gonna start the emitter before the scene has begun. So that gives us this instead. So it's already begun snowing, but they're kind of floating aimlessly and they don't really look so believable. It's really starting to take shape. So let's just hide the particle settings for the moment and let's wander on down to physics. So under physics, we have a couple of different models. The first is air and the other is bounce. And we want to keep it on air because we don't want the particles to really interact with the, the ground. We don't need to worry too much about that. But we do want to start playing with the gravity 
and the settings for the air. So let's take a look at those. And it's really going to be a couple of things that make everything happen here. And that's going to be the air resistance, the spin amplitude, and down here in the turbulence field, as well as the, uh, the wind. And by mixing these, it's going to really sell this effect. So if we play with the wind resistance and go extreme, it's basically going to create an anti-gravity. And if I play through now, the particles just kind of kind of gather and stay in place. But uh, what I want to do is have a relatively low value and something like 0 0.2 should be sufficient. So it's going to have a little bit of resistance. And if we go in and start playing with the gravity, we can start to really get the snow look. I'm going to set the gravity to around about 50. And that's already taken care of most of the problems. Now we've got something that looks a, a little more like snowfall. We need to fix the emitter because we can see at the back there where the, uh, where the snow is populating. So I'm going to go back to this setting here and I'm just going to make sure that that's outside of the frame. If we come back to the beginning and check it now, that's looking pretty okay. What you will notice though is it's a little more dense in the background area here and it's not so dense in the side. So we can fix that by stretching the emitter over. We can also modify the Z space a bit more as well so we have a bit more depth so we have more particles nearer to the camera and that's getting there but to really fine tune and adjust it it's best to go into the layer new and choose camera and if you don't know what the camera was used or what what lens they used on the set you should probably have a chat with the dp or the director of photography and figure out what that was or as i did took an estimated guess as this is a wide angle shot. I assumed around about 24 millimeters should be reasonable enough. And what that's going to do, I'm just going to have to, my mouse is, uh, the battery's running out. What that's going to do is enable us to move around the particles as if they were in 3D space. So if I hit C on the keyboard a couple of times, I'll see this icon where I'm able to zoom just through the particles and readjust them. So if I go back way too far, we're going to reveal the sides, but if we get them round about there, we're going to have a reasonable spread. So let's take a look now. So now we're getting there, we're almost done. Uh, what we want to do though is try to work with the other settings for the emitter to give it a bit of dynamic by messing with the wind and spin frequency. When you analyze snowflakes, you'll notice they don't just fall down by themselves, some kind of fall, and then they lift and float back up again. And I found by playing with the spin amplitude, I can get most of the effect I'm looking for. So I'm gonna just crank that right up. If we go nuts, they'll just like f fly around like bees. And that's, um, not so useful, but I found round about 200 gave me a relatively good kind of snow look. So it's a little more chaotic, a little more organic. But what we also want to do is affect the uh, wind and turbulence. For the wind, I want to leave the X alone. I only want to focus on the Y and the Z. So if we pull uh, the Y value, Hold on. Let's try there. If I pull the white, it's going to act more like gravity and it's going to blow those particles down much faster. But what I want to do is juggle the Y value and the Z value. I wanted it to look like they're blowing towards him. It's always best if you go somewhere in the middle. And I want those particles to kind of blow back out. So as if he's walking into the storm. If we preview few through now, we'll see they're blown down and they're blown towards him. 
But uh, we need to compensate by moving our camera back in a little bit because when we use the, the wind, it's going to blow those particles away. And we need to make sure they're still on screen. So it's somewhere around about there. Should be pretty okay. Maybe out a little bit more. And we can always go back up and compensate with our X value. And okay, let's have a look now. And that's, that's looking pretty okay. The only other thing I would focus on other than the wind is the turbulence field. In particular, we would take the effect position, just crank that up a little bit. And that's just gonna add a little bit more dynamics. You see some kind of fall down and float back up again. And if we go really crazy with that, you'll see it looks a little more wild, a little more like a snowstorm. But again, just a lower value should be sufficient enough to give it a moderate amount of chaos without completely ruining the shot. And probably about 50 should be sufficient for this. And there we have it, we're almost there. So I'm gonna increase the number of particles from 300 to maybe about 500. Or maybe about 400. And we can also see here in the info panel the number of particles that are on screen at any one time. So if this number starts to get really crazy, you might find that when you go to export it, it might just freeze and it won't be able to render due to the amount of information. So the way to handle that is to come back to the particles and just lower that value there and you should be good. Okay, the last thing really to focus on now that we've got our settings figured out here is uh, motion blur. So when they move through the scene, we want them to not look so sharp on every frame and actually look like there's a, a little bit of motion blur. So we can do that in, in a couple of different ways. So first we can enable motion blur for the timeline. So if I click here, now it's switched on, but we also need to tell it on a specific layer to enable the motion blur as well. And what we should see if I zoom in, if we go to full uh, 100 and let's put it to full resolution. When I enable this setting, you should see that if you keep your eye on this one here, it's very sharp at the moment. And when I click on motion blur, you can see it move. And if we do a quick RAM preview, we'll see that the, f the closer they are to the camera, the more blurred they become. And the ones further away look a little bit sharper. And um, for many of you, this might be just fine, but I didn't think that this gave me the desired look I was going for. So instead I choose to use an effect inside of here called Force Motion Blur. With, this is a plugin that comes with After Effects and um, it's pretty intensive, but it can get you out of a tight spot when you think that the native motion blur isn't really doing what you want it to. So for this, my settings were 20 and I think Something like 200. Or maybe it was more, maybe it was 300. Okay, and hopefully you noticed now there's a, a lot more motion streaks. So this, I thought, added a, a great level of drama and it felt like the snow was blowing a bit harder. The problem is it is quite a, a heavy plugin, so it's gonna take much longer to render. So I'm just gonna do a quick RAM preview and I'll jump back once the RAM preview is done to show you the result. So the RAM preview is completed. Let's take a look at the final effect with the CC Force Motion Blur added. So let's have a look. So hopefully you'll notice that the particles that are moving faster have an increased amount of motion blur versus those in the background that look a bit sharper. And I think that this is a little better than the native motion blur where you can't really configure the settings for them. So I've been Kevin Gator for premiumbeat.com. 
you want to see the full breakdown, you can head over to my Vimeo page. I'd like to thank Mons Bertus and Daniel Berman for allowing me to use the footage from the film to show you this effect. So thank you for watching and see you next time.